It doesn't have to be always new, at large. So scaling is about use, solutions, and at large. And there are different ways of scaling. I think the first one is that most of us are really familiar. It's about the number of users using these solutions, basically the adoption. And um, as Wanda said in CGAR, we've been doing this adoption type of scaling for a very long time, but that's not the only thing we're doing. Scaling also means scaling the use in times. What does that mean? If we have a solution typically used by farmers, a digital solution, let's say, just for pre-harvesting uh, season. And if we increase the use of the digital app to a continuous process where the farmers keep using the app for different advisory, we are actually scaling. It's the same farmer, it's the same app, but we increase the number of times that we generate contributions. So in a nutshell, times is also scaling. The third one is types. We might be dealing with different types of scaling. I'm sure you are aware of uh, you know, how, how it is but like in your, in your work. So when we see the scaling something, we can always go for other uses. The fourth one is geographies. It's about scaling in different places or scaling out. The fifth one, scaling in objectives. Sometimes we try to improve the use of the solutions at large for income purposes, but maybe it's also beneficial for nutrition or empowerment. We might be working with the same number of people with the same solution, but if you increase the benefits and different objectives, you're still scaling. And finally, it's deep. Our engagement with this, the farmers around this solution might increase their capabilities to use these solutions at large. And they can change their behavior to use science, technology, and innovation. And that means also scaling. So the, one of the learning that is coming from the scaling science, let's say, scaling can be defined in multiple ways. And when we work on the scaling, we have to be informed about how much we are contributing to each. Maybe we're gonna stuck at the adoption level. Maybe there is no more farmers that we can influence, but we can still influence the use of times, types, and objectives. In a nutshell, scaling is broad and we have to be sensitive about all these dimensions. And another thing that's coming from primarily CGI experience, but I think it's increasingly correct for the other ecosystems as well, scaling is not delivery. Delivery and scaling, although they seem to be used interchangeably, they are not the same thing. Delivery is usually done by us, by research and innovation actor in the CGI system and beyond. Delivery, we do the deliveries with partners that we select and that contribute to the work. Usually we are the one leading the delivery work in multiple projects, but in the project setup. And then we work in deliveries and especially that's very prominent in excellence agronomy on developing minimum viable solution. And most of the time in daily works focus on the innovation. How about scaling? As opposed to delivery, scaling happens. I'm highlighting the happens. We cannot fully plan scaling. One of the misconceptions in, in, in our work, especially science-based innovation system, is that we can really ensure scaling after what we do. That's not correct. Scaling is beyond us, and we try to increase the chances of scaling, but we cannot ensure that that's going to happen. Secondly, delivery happens with partners, but scaling happens with communities. We cannot have only a single set of partners and achieve scaling. We need to always engage with more partners and those partners need to converge around the same vision. In other words, for scaling, we need communities and go beyond the partners. The third dimension, because of this nature, we cannot really lead scaling. Research and innovation actors, agencies, and systems are there to produce innovations, maybe do the early delivery, but they never reach the numbers and investment capacity to go for the massive use of scale. Therefore, we always need some other organizations to lead scaling. And because also it's a large engagement that takes time, we cannot ensure scaling with a single project. We need a multiple projects which are coherent, in other words, a portfolio to move or move the scaling. Another difference between delivery and scaling is that in scaling, we need a proven solution. If you want to go at a very large scale, we, can, we need to be sure that what we do works. 
And finally, when you look at the configuration of the scaling projects, most of the time, it's not about the technology anymore or the digital solution itself. It's about building an ecosystem in that specific geography that we want to scale. It's about identifying complementary missions, be it markets, be it behaviors, be it organizational arrangement, and improving that. So in a nutshell, delivery and scaling differs significantly from each other. And achieving delivery and achieving scaling are very different things. How about the other dimension? What is scaling and what's not? What's impact? So scaling, as we said in the beginning, is about use. And it can disappear. We might be have a successful in increasing the use of a solution at large scale, but then our intervention works or something changes dramatically and it can disappear. But impact is different. When we're talking about impact, we're talking about actually benefits and it's usually sustained. In a nutshell, scaling and impact are different things. They focus on different things and then they don't necessarily imply each other. Okay, we move on. So we have now have a better idea about what is scaling and I will continue with why scaling. I think most of us being here already convinced about that, but let's revisit. So we have to scale because there are urgent problems that are large scale in nature. The climate is changing, we have massive unemployment, and then there are major equity concerns that implements the security in multiple parts of the world. And we know from West Africa, especially these days, well, there are large scale problems that we have to address. We cannot address large scale problems with small solutions or solutions used at small scale. Secondly, societies, clients, the ones who pay for our services and donors demand large scale solutions. I don't know when was the last time you had an opportunity to, lead, to listen to African leadership. That's very strong emphasis on scaling. They go even to the extent of saying that they don't want to have any more innovations. They only want scaling. Of course, we know that that cannot be mutually exclusive, but I think you got the point and you keep most of us adhering. We, the, we have a large and clear demand for scaling. A third point why we need scaling, the cost of production decreases. To be able to develop a digital solution, an agronomy solution, we do a lot of experiments. We do a lot of, we spend a lot of, let's say, fixed costs. As we increase the use, we decrease the unit cost. It's in the, one of the major premises of economics theory. We decrease the cost. And finally, big numbers are attractive. Scaling is not demanded because it's just necessary or it's absolutely critical, but it's also nice. If you look at the economies going from the low income to middle income, you will see that they are always chasing for big constructions and large numbers. So scaling itself is, in, a, in, a, in other words, has some psychological or social elements in it. And maybe you were also wondering, and in CTR that comes a lot, can we really not do scaling? The answer is no. We cannot really avoid scaling. Doesn't mean that every one of us needs to work on it, but we have to understand and we have to think that the solutions developed by C3R systems that we own needs to always aim for use at scale. And the next question, we now know what is scaling, what is it not? And we have, we have I think now clear about why we need scaling, it's about how. This is the million dollar or maybe the billion dollar question. And when you look at the science, of scaling and the experience, there are a few learnings that's coming up. So what are they? First of all, scaling happens when three things are, uh, three things are achieved. First, to achieve scale, we need to have large scale demand from payers and influencers. There has to be demand. It has to be from those ones who have the money or influence. Secondly, to scale, we need technical excellence. The solutions we are developing needs to be effective and efficient solutions. And thirdly, there needs to be many users who can access and use the solutions independently, what we call unreliant. So scaling happens in a very generic, very simple nutshell, when we combine demand with technical excellence with large scale underlying users. What does that mean? I think it looks very intuitive, 
but maybe there are some differences. The first, when we talk about the demand, we talk about those who can pay and influence. It's not about the demand for beneficiaries. What does that mean? We know that the farmers are usually low, coming from the low income neighborhood and they are poor. We have many small enterprises with their challenges. They have a lot of needs, that's for certain. And we try to do our best to achieve that. But most of them, they don't have demand or effective demand power. To be able to scale, we have to be very sensitive and informed about who can actually pay and influence. And we have to prioritize them as the demand actors. Secondly, on the technical side, technical excellence is not only about effectiveness, it's also efficiency. What does that mean? I mean, in C3R systems and the developer world, we usually go for the most shiny solution that uses the state of the art knowledge and science, maybe. But usually those ones are not the cheapest and not the simplest. When we want to scale, we need to make sure that the solutions are not only works well, but they can be used very simply and they are very cheap. Certainly technical excellence, just in the performance or effectiveness and ignoring efficiency will be a big, big bottleneck. So when you define the technical efficiency in a nutshell, we're talking about not only how it performs, but what is the resource use? Thirdly, we're talking about end users. If a lot of farmers are using our solution during the project, does that, that mean scaling? Because we, can, we might be paying them and incentivizing them. What matters is for us to see if the scaling is happening, looking at those independent end users who are especially not paid for us. In a nutshell, scaling happens when we combine effective demand, technical excellence, and underlying use. That's simple, but how do we qualify them really plays a role. Continuing. So if you want to increase the demand, technical excellence and underlying use, what do we need to do? This is actually, there are a lot of things you probably heard, but looking at the experience of CGAR, excellence in agronomy and beyond, there are some patterns appearing. The first one is that we have to know our investors, not only our farmers. I'm repeating, we have to know our investors, not only our farmers. I will come back to that later a bit more in detail. Secondly, we need to engage with purpose, not with everyone. We have to be selective whom we are partnering, whom we are engaging. We don't need to have, we shouldn't have a blanket approach where we will partner with everybody who's talking and interesting. And finally, we need to engage intent intelligently, not generically. What that means, we need to use data and information to make those decisions. Let's see how they are. We have to know our investors. What you see on the screen is very small. Apologies for that, but this actually, and coming from a structural connection plan, we are co-developing with another CGI initiative, Western Central Africa. So there, what we do is that we try to learn who's our investor. Investors are different. Imagine how much time and resources we are spending on farmer typologies. And now think about how much time you really spend on understanding what kind of investors can be right for the purpose, for our funding purposes. When we ask this question and discuss the excellence in agronomy meetings and in other meetings in CHDR, we realize that actually it's almost zero. There's a huge diversity of investors and it's critically important to know who they are, which one of them can fit our current needs. Some of them are research investors, some of them are scaling investors, some of them are impact investors, some of them are private, some of them are public. And we need to be very strategic and intentional on knowing our investors. After knowing them, we have to win their hearts. What does that mean? We are scientists, we work with the like well-established workflows and organizations, that's true, but it doesn't mean that we are not human. When you look at the investment decisions, you will see that it's not totally rational. It's about friendship, it's about networks, it's about also how the solution addresses our human needs. Therefore, once we identify who our right investor is, we need to be strategic about winning their hearts. And finally, of course, we have to win their minds. We have to be very clear. We have facts on our side. We have a compelling case. To sum up, 
it's very important for us for scaling purposes to know the right investor, to define it, to research on it, to spend time on it, to identify the right time investor. We need to be very strategic within their hearts, emotions, priorities, and finally, we should combine it with facts. And once we look at the, actually with this eyes with the CGAR, I think we will see that most of the time we are very good in the minds part, but we are usually very implicit or not even caring about the hearts. And we spend very little time on identifying the right investor. To improve, we need to be strategic about knowing the investors and winning their hearts and minds. So what is the other learning that's coming from CGAR scaling practices? The other learning that's coming, we need to engage with purpose. To really scale, we need to know who is who and what they need to hear about. Typically, we can say that we have three different stakeholders for scaling purposes. We have those ones who pay. I call it sponsor in, that presentation, in the presentation on the left. We have those ones who use, basically the ones that we are really targeting in terms of design and development. And Thirdly, those who benefits. I don't want to go for the details, but as you already, I think, implicitly feel, the way the sponsor, user, and beneficiary behave and relate and respond to us are different. Sponsors are about, you know, payment. They are interested in money most of the time or rates of returns, and they typically respond and become our investment targets. Users are usually the ones who, I mean, they are by definition the ones who are the user of solutions. They are trying to use it effectively and efficiently. They consider the time and one of their concerns. And that's whom we are targeting the scaling. And finally, beneficiaries are the ones who benefit from the solution and they try to maximize their benefits and they are our impact targets. So in a nutshell, when you look at the CGI actually ex experience, Unfortunately, we are not that clear about who are the sponsors, who are the users, who are the beneficiaries, which one of the stakeholders or one or one or two of them. And we are not really intentional in our defining our engagement. So in a nutshell, we need to engage with purpose. We have to be very clear who are our sponsors, who are our users, who are our beneficiaries, and how best we can engage with them, what kind of information and um, interactions should be the best. And thirdly, engaging with intelligence. So it's actually probably you, you might be already smiling. In CGR, we are preaching a lot to the converted. When we look at actually the our engagement and stakeholders, we have to have intelligence. On the left side, you usually a scale from zero to nine to characterize where the stakeholders are. Basically, it shows that are they just people who never heard about it? They're, or are they so convinced and you've you been so much they want to actually lead projects on it? So every stakeholder we have of importance or relevance goes because, uh, from not aware to hopefully to leader. But what happens is that it's very typical. We have at the level four, we convinced a lot of stakeholders to, our, to use our digital solutions. And we are still trying to impress them that how useful it is. They are already convinced. We don't need to design activities and waste our time and resources for increasing their awareness because they're already done. So what do we need to do? Go for the practical side. Their attitudes are already settled. We need to enable them to use the solution. So if they are four, we need to aim for five. Or if they are already aware, we need to try to sensitize them and make them curious and convince them. We shouldn't try to make them user just immediately being able. So in a nutshell, in engaging with stakeholders, we need to be intelligent. We need to know where they are and we try to go stepwise. And unfortunately in CGI, we have a very little understanding on that. And just after making them aware, we think that they will lead the projects or will be users. And most of the time we fail. So this is actually, so far we saw what scaling is, how we can achieve at scale and reflect a little bit about our previous experience. But what we see is indeed that scaling is changing. 
So what are those changes? We know that the scaling is not going to be the same, and that's reflected for our, our funding opportunities. We see that our funding or CGL funding is decreasing, and we have to innovate. So we have to innovate the way we do scaling. So what is the niche scaling? When you look at the scaling, there are four major trends. The first one is that there are no more easy wins with standardization. What it means is that you know previously we used to have a solution, we standardized processes, and that's enough. It will generate benefits at scale. Is no more. Secondly, the new trend is that it's been understood by the donors, stakeholders, and definitely for us. You cannot scale solutions from by just a project framework. Scaling world is moving from projects to platforms, which I will show some examples, and even to the hubs. There's a clear learning from the science and the practice that single interventions won't are not efficient for scaling. And it needs to go for capability building, even the hubs. The third trend is we for scaling, typically what we do is validate and show that it works. But actually, that's not how it's when you look at the digital solutions, just showing how it works is not sufficient for scaling. So the approach is now going towards what's called living lab, basically experimentations where different stakeholders of digital solutions interact and structure processes. And finally, a new trend is appearing and that's very, maybe scary, maybe a big opportunity, but AI is here. So it is important to, when you look at the business world and you know those Harvard business reviews and so on, all about AI now, the key word is augmented intelligence. What it means is that how are we gonna match the capabilities of human with the capabilities of AI and boost productivity? So in a nutshell, we have four new ways of our new trends in scaling, and they are important and we need to change the way we do scaling. Let's have a look, a deeper look at them. So no more easy wins. What do you see is an excellent agronomy dashboard in the, or I'm trying to understand the use case management, basically the leads of innovators. What do they need in terms of scaling support? In excellence and agronomy, we have a global team from almost all the centers now providing expertise on scaling. We have coordinated action and try to really match capabilities of scaling support with the needs of the use case managers or say innovation managers. And we have a dashboard for that. When we did the initial inquiry with the managers, how we can support best, we, can, we came across an interesting picture. The first one is that the demand, oops, sorry. The first one is that demand for learning for scaling, like the concepts and scaling gradients you see on the left side, is much less than the practical learning. So that was very interesting, especially for a person who is parroting this scaling readiness work. He's like, oh, wow, nobody's interested in science I'm doing. <laughs> and But that's normal. Because excellence in agronomy is about digital solution. It's about taking the solutions to farmers. So what is important is the practice. So what we serve is just a validation or proof that if you want to provide support, we need to provide support for practice. Use the concept, but don't come up with generic concepts anymore. Secondly, what we found out, you can discover that from the, again, the board, managers demand on scaling support differs significantly. We had multiple items trying to see if there are any quick wins where we can offer and you know, support to all use cases. The answer was no. There were many differences. Some of them are prioritized innovation processes. The others prioritize support in stakeholders. The others support in more project management. So what we realize is that the demand from research managers differs. And thirdly, we discovered that not everybody is at the same place, same level in terms of scaling. Some of them don't even data. They don't know scaling. They need to generate data to do it properly. But some of them already have strategies and they want to adjust. Third learning was that we need to be really sensitive about where different innovation teams in terms of their maturity of scaling thinking and management. And finally, when we discovered that not the scaling restriction differs, some of the projects or the innovation teams are very flexible in terms of timing, what should they can aim for the partners, but some others were very restricted. 
they had to play with the restrictions. So in a nutshell, what we discovered, and that's coming from the scaling, um, science of scaling in general, there's no more easy wins for scaling. You cannot come up with a solution and support for scaling. It has to be really case specific, and it has to be really based on the demand from the managers. So the sec second scaling and new trends from well validation to living labs. I think you all heard living labs, what it is, but it's basically an exper experiential experimental space where you co-develop, interact and co-design and provide feedback and update the solution with the stakeholders. When we try to actually work on excellence in agronomy and beyond, we realize that we have to be flexible and ready for supporting multiple things. Sometimes the support is around innovation package design, which means how we can identify the other complementary solutions. Sometimes it's about helping them to raise money. Sometimes this isn't where they are. Sometimes helping them to engagement. So the, the period or the, the ways that we do scaling just by offering blanket sheet services is no more. It's important to think scaling as an experiment, experimental space and be ready with what kind of support. And based on the demand, be flexible. And this is the new scaling, and this is how it is actually done in, in the other industries as well. The third new trends from projects to multi stakeholder in code platforms and hubs. Actually, excellence in agronomy is very intentional of that transition. What I'm showing you, you might be seeing in presentations in different uh, excellence in agronomy events. Initially, excellence in agronomy was using a typical use case model. What it means, there's a demand partner, demand partner needs solutions and these service the solutions. And there were partial achievements in increasing the numbers, but that we realized that, you know, that's not sufficient. We are missing a lot of opportunities. And then the model evolved, okay, we have a multi, maybe a single demand partner, but can we increase the amount of services provided with that partner? There was again partial success, but it was not enough. And it is here already, if you have any questions, Manla is with us, is the one of the brain, um, you know, the thinkers of, of that can explain more. But now it's since an moving towards platforms. What does that mean? It's trying to design and develop or enable infrastructure for different demand partners to interact with the different science teams and innovator teams we have, and then co-develop the solutions at the same time. So excellence in agronomy from moving from the projects gradually towards a platform where the innovator processes are more interactive, less planned, but more and more and more uh, the higher scope. That's indeed coming from the science of scaling as well. We need to go beyond the projects. We need to develop platforms as spaces of interaction. And how about that? Platforms are not the stop. Platforms should evolve into innovation hubs whenever it's possible. What do you see on the screen is an example from Rwanda, where I'm also based partially. It's called Norsken Chigali. I'm sitting in those um, buildings and sharing the space with some 200 companies. There are more than 1,000 entrepreneurs. And in that space, three venture capital investors are sitting. And you know what? Their portfolio is more than 700 million USD dollars just for Africa. And one of the interesting things happening, when you have a space where innovation happens, community is there, you attract attention. I think it was like two months ago, we suddenly surprised the president of Zambia was there, you know, just enters where you're working. Oh, wow, the, the honorary president, I don't even know what to say, and you might imagine our surprise, Zambian president visited us. And two weeks ago, we had all the governors of Nigeria. You see the group on the second photo, you know, our community manager was trying to explain. So you go to the office, you get your coffee, and then you meet with the governor of one Nigerian state. So what happens is platforms, when they move, they enable different opportunities. And sometimes the stakeholders that matters comes to you. In a nutshell, some of the trends in scaling is moving from projects to platforms, and if possible, from platforms to hubs. And the fourth and the last one of the scaling trends is about AI and it's about augmented intelligence. What does that mean? Augmented intelligence means that, you know, there are things that the human can do better. 
and there are things that the machine can do better. Despite the fear that artificial intelligence will take the jobs, most of the key managers and global innovators and Googles and digital solutions are actually thinking about how they can change their business so the people who work can benefit from the artificial intelligence, how they can augment AI into workloads. Maybe in the agricultural space, food space, we are not doing that intentionally, but in each of, each of us needs to start, especially the organizational managers, to start thinking how we can use AI to improve our workflows. It was interesting. We published a paper a few years ago about human hybrid approach, and then the chat GPT came and imagine the demand for that. So we have to be really thinking about AI. We have to be really thinking about how we can leverage AI to improve human productivity. If we ignore, probably we will not be successful at scaling. Thank you very much. I really took your time and maybe bombarded with a lot of concepts. I'm really looking forward to questions and discussions. Over to you, Manna and Barbara. Wow, Thank, thanks a lot, Murat. I think uh, it is fair to say that uh, this is really what uh, a masterclass is all about. <laughs> um, we probably need a glossary of terms after this because uh, <laughs> there, there are quite a few um, you know, concepts that, that you introduced in the, in the masterclass today. And, and, and I think uh, as is often the case with such presentations, you, you do also stir up a bit of uh, controversy and, uh, and I think one of the, the controversies was right at the beginning where you tried to uh, separate, uh, you know, the, 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 the beneficiaries uh, from uh, the, what you call the demand, the sources of demand, right? And uh, one of our colleagues on the call, uh, a million, I think is based in Ethiopia, is really wanting to, to understand uh, why are you saying end users do not have demand? Why are you focusing the demand on people with influence and money? Uh, could you give some reflections on that? Sure. Thanks for the excellent question, Million. And I was expecting this. So that's really great. You know what? Like, actually, I mean, uh, when you look at the experience we have, we're trying to directly bypass the existing systems existing innovation systems, and we feel that we can deliver farmers at large scale. But that's not correct. First of all, farmers or the, the end users have many needs, and there are many more ways of solving those problems. When we are thinking about, let's say, in Ethiopia, what's the priorities of Ethiopian government solving these might be different than ours. What we are saying in defining the demand we should focus on really the influencers or payers is that we have to be cognizant about the practices and approaches those influencers and investors are using. We have to try to improve their systems if you want to achieve scale, rather than coming with an in our own world idea and solution for farmers. But scaling necessitates clear understanding of existing structures and respond to those who have investment capability and who have the influence. If they do it right or wrong, we don't know. But in the end, they are the ones who decide. Is it good and, enough? And, and, and Murad, maybe, maybe if I can, if I can uh, you know, uh, do a follow-up. So, so would it be fair to say that um, uh, what we are saying is that uh, let's take farmers, for example. We are not saying in any way that farmers do not have a demand for the solutions. The solutions are created to respond to particular pain points that mm -hmm. the farmers have. But if we're going to deliver the solution, we have to be honest enough to say that it's unlikely that farmers will bear the cost of accessing the solution. So how do we make sure that the people who can actually help us get close to farmers, make it possible for farmers to receive the solutions? These are the people that we are, we are, we are convincing. Have I, have I summarized it well? Yeah, exactly. 
Exactly. We're not saying that we don't care about the farmers. It's the exact opposite. We care about the farmers and we are being realistic about that. Exactly. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Um, so so there's a there's a follow-up. There's a question coming from uh, uh, one of the members of the audience. Uh, this one is anonymous, unfortunately, and they are saying, well, they really like this idea of, um, you know, creating multi-stakeholder platforms, because this is not new. We have seen them all over the place. But would you uh, say what is the distinction between a multi-stakeholder platform and a hub? Uh, can a multi-stakeholder platform be just virtual? Uh, or physical? Can the hub also be virtual or physical? How do you separate these two from the experience that you've gathered? Mm -hmm. Multi-stakeholder, both multi-stakeholder platforms and hubs are by the definition multi-stakeholder. What differentiates them? Hubs are there is long term. We can have multi-stakeholder platforms or you know multi-stakeholder engagement for a purpose. For example, we have coalition of the willing from Ethiopia. It's a multi-stakeholder platform for sharing data and enabling. But once it's done, it's achieved its objective. So mm -hmm. it, it's actually closing its mission. But hubs are not like that. They are there continuously, they are adapting. And secondly, hubs are usually evolves around the larger community. The example I gave, North is for example, it's thousands of people with the investors from uh, big investors, big innovators, president of visiting. So it usually creates a big, uh, let's say, ecosystem and a community around that. Platforms are usually specific to value chains and professions. Although there can be multiple representation, they are more focused. And maybe the last thing, maybe the hubs are, you know, is also about fun. So one of the learning coming from the innovation hubs is Norskin. They have a lot of social events, parties, engagements, the best coffee they claim in the whole country. Hubs is also about creating a nice environment for people to share and co-innovate together. Multi stakeholder platforms can be like that, but they are more, mostly mission focused, not necessarily culture focused. So, so would I be correct then, Murat, in saying that uh, um, what you are describing in terms of the trends is that we need to start thinking about an innovation value chain. Yeah? An innovation value chain that starts with the delivery part where centers within the CG are doing you know, hardcore science, developing solutions. But delivery, as you said, is not scaling. Uh, we then need to make sure that our solutions are walking all the way through that value chain which includes mm -hmm. uh, some of these scaling uh, uh, innovations, the platforms, and ultimately the hubs, but it's an ecosystem. And each part of the ecosystem needs to play its part if ultimately the beneficiaries that we are targeting are going to get the services that they need. Would you agree exactly. with that? Exactly. We should do our best part and end over systematically. As we've seen in the first definition, our focus might be delivery, but scaling we cannot control. And at an even larger scale, our influence decreases. We have to enable the others to do that. And exactly, if we gradually move from more focused delivery to hub structure. So Manjai, Brilliant. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, mil Millions hand has been up for a while as you would like to, to challenge um, some of your statements. May I ask you to give him a chance to, to come in before you move on to the next questions? Thanks. Yeah, sure. Sure, it's a pleasure. Go ahead. Is, is Million able to unmute and, uh, and speak, Barbara? I've given him permission to talk, yeah. Okay. Please go ahead, Million. Okay, maybe while he sorts himself out, can we um, then proceed to, to the next question? To the other questions, yeah. Okay, so, so, so the next question, Morat, is, uh, you know, you said something very interesting in your presentation that um, uh, scaling is necessary because we are trying to solve some big problems. And one of the biggest problems we face uh, on the African continent is that um, 
there's a serious nutrition challenge. There's a serious nutrition challenge. And we as scientists or from the science community, we've tried to solve this by creating these lovely biofortified uh, crops. You know, there's orange maize, there's orange flesh sweet potato. And we know that these solutions can deliver, uh, you know, nutrients in a very effective way. But we also know that, well, we have not really been able to get these varieties in the hands of all the people who've got a nutrition challenge. Using your, 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 your latest thinking on, 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 uh, on scaling, what would you advise those of our colleagues that are in the space of developing these biofortified crops? How can they make sure these crops get into the plates and the pots and eventually the mouths of millions of Africans in Sub-Saharan Africa? How, what would be your response or advice to that? That's a very interesting uh, question. Is that the first one is that revisiting the distinction between, uh, again, the million will come back and I want to link it there as well. Who are the sponsors and influencers will take the next stage of scaling it and who are the beneficiaries? I think one of the things that we were going to at um, you know, C3I, we have significant experience, especially with the Harvest Plus. But what we realized is that it came to its natural delivery capacity. So it focused on delivery, you know, it's tried to deliver, but then it came to a level it cannot deliver any further. So what happened is that maybe it will happen in the future, but transition from delivery to scaling couldn't happen sufficiently. So going back to your questions to enable the user nutrition, you know, positive and sensitive or advantages, varieties, we need to create a community. We need to improve the capacity of other organizations, be it African local organizations, be it the private sector, to prepare proposals, use them themselves without our involvement and support. So we need to create the capacity of others to scale. Once we start achieving that, they, we will be going to the next frontier. But I think that is the answer. Now it's time for us and to stop delivering and enable the others to do that. And, and I think you make an important point that, uh, and this is really maybe where your response to million was, was on point to say, well, uh, the farmers, yes, need uh, good nutrition. You know, um, uh, orange flesh sweet potato is good for the farmers and for their communities. But if we're not going to enable and empower the people with money and influence, our hard work is not going to get to the farmers. But then it raises a question which Nicoletta has raised and raised quite sharply, the issue of inclusivity, Murat. Um, you've not said anything about what Nicoletta calls responsible scaling or inclusive mm -hmm. scaling, uh, because we do know that there's the political economy of all these things, right? Um, women will be marginalized, youth will be excluded, and poorer communities will have less access to solutions. How, what would be your take on how the agricultural community can achieve inclusive and responsible scaling? Actually, like the, you know, Nico is right. And in the definition of scaling, the first, like when we, I, I can even, I think, pull that back. When we were talking about the scaling, we were mentioning different dimensions of scaling. So the practically, the first thing to do is we monitor different dimensions of scaling. So how, for example, the behavioral aspects of scaling is changing. I think in the literature, what Nico says is both scaling deep or changing the cultures and behaviors, we, that's very important. And the first start, we start measuring it. When we look at the current accountability systems, it's really primarily focused on adoption, maybe geographies, you know, a bit of adoption and out, but the other dimensions are not really systematically reported. Then what happens? In some projects, in terms of adoption, we are very bad. But then actually we have significant improvement in the behavioral dimensions of the scaling. Since we don't measure and report, we don't inform the donors or investors that we actually did a good job at scaling. And that's very typical. So the first thing to Nico's answer, it's definitely there, but we need to measure it first. We need to report it to show the donors that actually what they are investing has been improving. But as we all know, culture change and behavior takes time. And then we are just going to do it. And they need to be with more pay. So the first answer is measuring it. 
The second answer in relation to behavior and so on, I will be again provocative here and very direct. You know, we have very little resources and we have in some cases very little mandate to change and influence African societies. We have to really know what our mission and we shouldn't go beyond preaching or telling people what they should do. The implication, when we approach the different inclusivity problems, we have to be working through, again, those influencers and neighbors and improve their capacity to be more responsive to inclusion. Again, it's difficult, it takes time, but we have to really enabling them to do that. Because if we try to do it ourselves, without really the, taking them alone, there can be a lot of repercussions or feedbacks that will even make things more difficult in the future. So in a nutshell, first, uh, Nico, the answer is first, we have to be very systematic about measuring our contributions to different types of scaling. That includes behavior and deep and inclusivity. And once we do that, we have to be also very realistic and focus on local systems and their capacity to do it over we try to do ourselves. Brilliant. Thank, thanks a lot, Murat. And I think the one thing I would add to, to our colleague, Nicoletta, is that, um, well, within excellence in agronomy, we actually recognize that uh, your po the point that you're raising is important. And uh, we have brought in two very critical elements into our work. The first one is um, the human-centered design approach, uh, which we are embedding into all the stages of innovation development to make sure that our innovation teams are not creating abstract solutions or, or solutions that are agnostic of the realities on the ground. But we know that's not even enough. And therefore we've also brought on board our teams from uh, the gender transformative approaches. We have also spent a lot of time investing in the innovation teams to have a good understanding of what it is to be gender responsive, uh, to, be, to be gender conscious and all the different levels, all the way to being gender transformative and to understand that you cannot transform without people. So you better understand where people are at, what their, uh, their own aspirations are and how you can uh, effectively respond uh, to those aspirations. But that's a very uh, important point. Million, are you now able to speak? Um, and we'll have you as the last contributor before we, uh, we, we, we wrap up for the day. Million? Uh, for some reason, Barbara, Million is, is struggling to, to, to speak. So I promise we have not muted him. And when we go to Addis, Murat and I will drink some good Ethiopian <laughs> coffee and have a debate with him. But uh, anything, he's somehow not able to speak here. Yeah. yeah, if anything, I've actually upgraded him to, to panelist because I thought that would solve his problem. But um, he's actually just sent a whole lot of um, points, feedback. And I think, um, Manila, yeah. you need to do the honors of... Um, no, let me, let me do that quickly. And, and this is homework for Murat. I, I think M Million's point is as follows, that, you know, there are probably three areas that we need to look at. That, um, well, when we say users will not pay, he says, well, they actually can pay um, <laughs> if we bring a product that is blended with other services uh, and we have a proven innovation. So I think he agrees with you on, the pro on, the, on, on having a technically competent solution that you want to scale. And he says that we might need to have continuous adaptation and packaging, and then they will be able to pay. He then makes the second point that, well, if, if we're saying that uh, the, the people with influence and, and, and money are the only ones who can make scaling happen, he's saying, well, maybe not, right? Uh, we may actually need, we might actually only succeed if we've got more benefits that are being seen by users. And I think all those are fair comments and I don't think they are in conflict with anything that we have said uh, on this webinar. But I think the point that Million makes, the point that uh, our colleague uh, Nico makes and, and a few of you have made in the chat line is that scaling is complicated. But as complicated as it is, 
it is an essential thing that we need to do because it's pointless for the CGIR to invest the millions that it's doing on solutions if those solutions are not going to have impact. And if those solutions are going to have impact, there's a whole lot of work we need to do in understanding that pathway to impact, in understanding the value chain that is associated with scaling and actually knowing who are the people that we need to put these solutions into the hands of to make sure that farmers actually receive them. And like Million says, it might mean people are able to, to, to create bundles of services that make it easy for farmers to access these solutions. But it also means that we need to understand that not all our end users or beneficiaries are the same. Therefore, our solutions must be able to, to, to take that into account. So I think I'd like to thank you, Murat, uh, for taking the time to, to prepare. And I don't know if you've got any last word uh, before we, we, we wrap up the webinar. Thank you very much for the opportunity. You know, this is a journey and I would be very happy to continue interacting. They can, uh, you know, reach us out in the excellence in agronomy to Barbara, yourself and myself. We will be very happy to uh, continue the conversations. Thanks for the opportunity. Already look forward to the second webinar. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Murat, and to our audience. I want to say, well, we are committing to convening conversations about taking agronomy to scale. And this was the very first one on trying to unpack scaling. We really want to thank you for the time and for the opportunity to converse with you on this. Over to Barbara. Thank you, everybody. Um, my ask is for you to continue looking out for some of these activities that we intend to you know, um, post out the conversations we intend to continue having with all of you. And um, I would like you all to, to just um, share with your colleagues, share with um, your farmers, if you are farmer facing and work with farmers um, and just bring everybody on board so that the work that we are doing is, is taken forward. It's 15.01 and um, I would like to end this session and um, see you next time. Bye. Yes, we will share the recording. Thank you very much, everyone. Cheers, everyone.